Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome. Thanks for your patience as um, we get started uh, here this evening and for braving what is uh, a little bit of an unknown with the weather this evening, but thanks for making your way down here and thanks for your continued uh, commit commitment to reform and uh, changes here, your role the members of the Safety Advisory Commission has taken a significant amount of time and energy, and we feel like we owe you uh, and the greater community an update and progress report. Uh, I'm, plow I'm proud and pleased to report that there has been significant progress uh, made, and uh, Director Clark and Chief Bryant will share most of those details with you this evening. Um, as you know, these 80 recommendations cover recruitment, training, diversity and inclusion, community engagement and independent investigations. They are wide ranging, but they reflect depth of thought and a sincere desire to provide the Division of Police guidance on how to best address some of the greatest challenges facing the division in our community. It's been a trying two years, an unprecedented time in our city, our country, and our world. Global pandemic, we're still working through a spike in violent crime. It's impacting Columbus with other mid-sized cities across the country, but I can assure you that we're working harder than ever to overcome these challenges and build a brighter future for our city. Uh, we hired the first ever chief of police from outside uh, Columbus, who also happens to be the first African-American woman to lead the division, Chief Elaine Bryant. We have a new director of public safety who has a strong commitment to change and reform, Director Robert Clark. We've seated the first ever Civilian Police Review Board chaired by our own Janet Jackson and hired the first Inspector General for the Division of Police, Jacqueline Hendricks. We've overhauled officer training to ensure that it is more immersive and inclusive, and we've recently graduated our city's most diverse recruit classes in both police and fire, by the way. We secure, uh, and we were able to secure a three-year contract with the Fraternal Order of Police uh, the most progressive contract uh, in our city's history. We also, for the first time in our city's uh, history, invited the Department of Justice uh, in uh, to our city and their COPS office, their Community-Oriented Policing Services Office, I believe is the name of that program, uh, is working directly with Chief Bryant specifically on um, training, use of force, and other reforms that she may be able to share some more updates on, but all historic uh, moves and reforms in large part because of the vision, the recommendations, the blueprint that you all helped uh, work uh, so hard on. So those are a few examples of the progress we've made, uh, but still have plenty of work ahead of us, and I'm confident in both uh, the director and chief uh, to lead the way. At this point, I'd like to turn things over to Director Robert Clark. Director. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, everyone. Uh, while we're certainly here to update you and really see where we are in, re in regards to the recommendations, I think it's important for us to pause for just a moment and understand what brought us here and what brought the commission together in November of 2017. And that was because of the innovative leadership of the mayor and his staff at the time, which did not include Chief Bryan and myself, but those who recognized that we had to do something different we had to change the way that we were operating. And all of this would have been before social unrest. All of this would have been before the pandemic. But certainly we recognized in 2017 that we had to do things differently. And I applaud the commission for coming together, certainly having difficult and hard conversations and providing the city with 80 recommendations that they were adamant that we had to develop and implement and lead in order to create a very different type of policing and service orientation in the city of Columbus. So that's just a very quick look back and what brought us here. The commission finished their work and submitted their report in 2020. And since then, the chief of police, her executive staff in partnership with public safety and certainly in partnership with a lot of other entities around the city began to dig into what those 80 recommendations meant in terms of operations, in terms of policy and procedure, in terms of training, in terms of technology, in terms of personnel assignments, recruiting, how we would seat our new generation of law enforcement officers in the city, 
and a wide variety of other things that we will share with you today. But while we gather here today to update you, this is still not finished work. We still have work before us. And Chief Bryan and her executive staff are hard at work just this week in executive session determining how these recommendations will change the complexity, the face, the engagement, and the transparency and communication of the Division of Police. But I'll leave that for the Chief to talk about. From the perspective of public safety, these recommendations not only caused us to look at how we were operating in the Division of Police, but how we were operating across public safety in its entirety. And I don't want us to forget that there's still a Division of Fire, there's support services, and a wide variety of other things that really positioned us with these recommendations to take a look at the work that we're doing across public safety. Chief Bryan and myself are new to Columbus, but we're not new to law enforcement. Between the two of us, we have over 55 years of experience, which we brought to Columbus, honorably and honored to be here, honored to partner with the women and men of the Division of Police and the rest of public safety, who I want to remind you and focus on are getting the job done every single day. And we're very proud of the work that they're doing. But we recognize that we have work to do. The recommendations, those we've completed, those that are in progress, and even those that require further development are just indicators and guidelines for us to do our work every single day. We recognize that we have to build back transparency, we have to build back trust, we have to build back communication, and as I've shared on multiple occasions, we are in an era of law enforcement and public service where we have to deliver that service and that protection in a way that the community understands, the community will accept, and the community will collaborate. And those three themes run consistently through these recommendations and consistently run through the work that we are completing. So I'm extremely proud of Chief Bryan and her executive staff and all those who went into building out and implementing these recommendations, which I'm sure we will talk about this evening. But one last thing that I will share with you, and I said this already, our work is not done. We will continue to need the partnership of the commission, even though they have been disbanded or they're not together anymore. We will need the help and collaboration of the community and other community partners to help us continue to not just implement these 80 recommendations, but where we find other things that need addressed, that we will have a transparent process in place. And if it requires hard conversations, that we can come to the table and have those conversations and continue to build back better law enforcement and public safety services in the city of Columbus so that we can be the gold standard. We can be the success story through this era of police reform. And I think that we are well under our way and I'm just proud to be honored, honored to be a part of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mayor. So I will say that while I've only been here eight months, um, the work that the department has done um, in the past couple of years has been tremendous. They've worked toward the goals of completing many of these recommendations. In my eight months though, we've, have, we've identified uh, many areas. Even though we have completed areas, that doesn't stop us from reevaluating, re reviewing, and uh, even improving on those completed things as well. So we're constantly reevaluating everything that we do so we don't just stop and say oh it's completed we're done we also make sure that we're going back making sure that we're uh even though it's been implemented is there some ways that we can improve it is there something that we can do to enhance it is there something that we can do to add on to it to make it even better so we're constantly doing that um the recommendations um they're we're focused on being transparent and being accountable not only to the residents of columbus but to ourselves as well so it's important that we make sure that we're policing ourselves. Uh, many of the major areas of focus the mayor talked about, he talked about the de-escalation, crisis intervention, implicit bias training, use of force policies, diversity, recruitment and retention, early intervention system and officer wellness. As you can see on the dashboard, there are 54 recommendations that were completed, completed in 18 in progress and four require further development. When we talk about in progress, we're talking about uh, recommendations that are in the active phase of planning, but they have not been implemented, but they are actively being planned. 
Uh, for requiring further development means that there's no active plan, but we're working towards a solution to implement. And a couple of those may require us to partner with, with people such as civil service to um, be able to implement those, such as the case manager for hiring process. So it's not just a matter of us doing it, but we have to partner and make sure that we have other entities that are on board to be able to complete it. Some of the things that we're proud of that have been completed, uh, we created a wellness bureau. Um, resilience training, um, making sure that we're taking care of our officers and making sure that their burnout, secondary trauma, and coping mechanisms are being addressed as well. Because we know that in order for officers to be effect effective and efficient on the streets, they have to be well themselves. So the Officer Wellness Bureau is, is a huge completion and a huge task that was undertaken. And I believe it's going to open up the new building next month in March. That's, that's the, uh, that's the uh, opening month. We also um, completed implicit and explicit bias training. That was important and huge as well. Um, the impact of implicit and, and or explicit bias, including racism and strategies for officers to use in recognizing and mitigating their own biases were integrated into our training modules for our officers. Um, we completed our mobile crisis, mobile crisis response team. Uh, the division is maintaining the mobile crisis response team, which is fully staffed. Uh, the team is currently able to cover the hours of 10 a.m. to midnight. There is potential for expansion as Columbus public health clinicians are hired to accompany officers. So we're in the process of expanding that program as well because we know how important it is for the residents. It's been extremely successful and they want us to do more and we're trying to expand that program. Uh, officers have been crisis intervention trained. We're continuing training this year, but last year we were able to offer advanced crisis intervention training to 63 officers. So we're continuing that training as well. One of the big ones the mayor talked about was our community emergent training for our officers. So we have a robust three-phase community emergent training that includes the academy and extends through an additional first year of probation. This includes the following, 64 additional hours of cultural competence and community emergent curriculum, poverty simulation, courses taught by community experts, intensive group projects designed to address community needs and involving community members, uh, recruit representations to CPD leadership, community members, and an emerging project placing recruits in neighborhoods for problem solving and engagement experience. That's important because as we bring officers onto our department, we want, we want to make sure that before they serve, before they protect, that they serve. The officers need to understand the community in which they're policing. So we found that before we put them on calls for service, it's really important for them to go into, go into the community, get to know the residents, get to know the business owners, get an opportunity to, to have some sort of engagement that doesn't require a call for service. Because we, we know that that's going to, when it, when, it, when it is time for calls for service, if you know the officer that's responding or if you're familiar with that neighborhood, your response is just different. You have a better understanding of what you're walking into. Uh, we also completed the mandatory post-incident drug and alcohol testing. Um, CBD officers are subject to mandatory post-incident drug and alcohol testing immediately following an officer-involved shooting or deadly use of force incident. So that was, that was huge. That is um, part of our requirement. And we also, through our cadet program, we've created a pipeline for CPD recruitment of young adults. So we've partnered with Columbus State Community College, and we develop a program that includes tuition reimbursement uh, for the cadets to receive their OPATA certification with the hopes that once they receive their certification that they'll join the department when they're eligible when they reach the age of 21. So that's going to be huge not only in bringing diversity within the department but also it's going to offer us the opportunity to recruit within our own community. So we're hoping that we, uh, uh, we uh, draw and attract people that live in the community because who better to complete the community than the members or the, the, the people that grew up here. Um, a couple of the areas that require for further development, we're working towards assigning the position of the Officer of Diversity and Inclusion, and that's part of the reorganization that the director talked about. We are right now looking at our department as a whole and trying to figure out what makes sense. We know that, unfortunately, we're going to be in a situation where we're going to be short some officers, so we have to make some hard and tough decisions about making sure that our priority is serving the residents of the city of Columbus and making sure that we're able to provide those services. Um, we also are in the process of um, 
the recommendation that officers should be trained on how to modify behavior to de-escalate situations with youth, we're still in the planning and research stages of that as well. So we're working on that. In addition to working on the recommendations and ensuring that they are implemented, we're also working with the Department of Justice. They are reviewing all of our policies and procedures and working with us to provide training to our officers, mid-level supervisors, and our management team. As a matter of fact, they'll be here next month to train our mid-level supervisors. So we're, we're really excited about that. They're looking at all areas of the division to help us create a more efficient and impactful department while also focusing on operations, community engagement, technology, recruitment, and retention. So those are some of the areas that we're working on. And if I could just add the uh, dashboard that's before you so that our residents understand, this is a public facing dashboard where anyone can log on to the dashboard and see exactly where we are on the 80 recommendations, those things that have been completed, those things that are in progress, and certainly those things that need further development. And we can demonstrate here for you an example that it will also have a note section so that it brings context to what the in progress means or what or, or context to what completion means. What does that actually mean? We, it's easy to say that, but if you click on there, it'll actually bring up the notes that will demonstrate what completion actually means. We're also involved, as I said earlier, a process to reevaluate as we are hiring new officers, as we get through this process of officers leaving the, the division, the chief is redesigning, reorganizing the division, and how will that impact these recommendations? In other words, Will we still be able to maintain those recommendations with so many personnel who will be departing? So we're prioritizing all of that. We're evaluating all of that to make sure that we will give as up-to-date information as possible on this public-facing dashboard. So again, we're building back trust. We're building back transparency and building back communication with our residents who certainly deserve these recommendations and many, many more that I'm sure will come just from our internal work that we're doing day in and day out. So I'd like to ask, are there questions that you have about the dashboard specifically? Uh, and I should probably defer to Ms. Jackson since she was the head of the, the commission before and see if she'd like to make some opening comments or have specific questions for us. I did not come today to make opening statements. I really came to listen on to you. And I have to share with you, I didn't really know about the dashboard and I don't know about other folks, but it's very challenging in this setting to see or to understand. So I'm looking forward to being able to go, to go back. I have a question for the, the chief. Um, you mentioned just one piece about juveniles. I remember, and I really wish that I had brought the executive summary so I could grill you more on our recommendations. <laughs> so maybe it's a good thing that I didn't. But I remember uh, that we were very concerned that there wasn't specific training at the academy as it related to juveniles. And we certainly had some board members who have much greater expertise and the brain development and all of that. And it was very important you know, to them. Um, and then I would say, especially since in light of the crimes that are taking place, and so many of them are younger. So could you, you, you made a comment about juveniles, but I'm not quite sure I understood what you were, were saying. Yes, exactly. You're talking about the brain development in regards to juveniles, and that is something that we looked at, and we've had some uh, changes in our uh, training academy and some leadership changes as it relates to upper management. So that is one of the things that's in progress. We are looking at bringing someone to the academy, to the academy to be able to train our officers as it relates specifically to the development of youth in the brain and how it works and how they need to modify, the officers need to modify their behavior when they interact with juveniles. So we are in the process of uh, planning that out and being able to roll out the training, but we are still in progress. Okay, all right. Are there other questions from other? Sure, uh, thank all of you for your work on this. It's hard to believe it was two years, Madam Chair, since the recommendations have been submitted, but it, that's the case. Um, I look at the recommend the 80 recommendations as being dynamic, you know, and, and, and not static. And what I mean by that is that they should flex, you know. And what's to say there shouldn't be 81 recommendations or 85 or, you know, or something like that, or, or maybe one of them is not as relevant as it was, you know, in 2017. 
So, you know, when we talk about the 80 recommendations, hopefully, you know, that's kind of a fluid, you know, discussion and you're not, you know, not looking at other, you know, important, you know, um, activities or, you know, interest areas that if we were to do it today and submit today that there would be something different in there. So how do you think about, I mean, I'm, you know, you know, as the city, I think, you know, looking at those recommendations is, you know, how do you build on them? And I, and I loved your comment that you just don't, you know, check them off because you can build on them and you can massage them and, you know, and to look at, you know, various aspects of it that might be brand new. To your point, that's exactly what happens. As the years go by or as things change, you have to look at things and say, does this make sense? Is it serving the purpose that it was intended to serve? So we, we always are reevaluating and making sure that we are implementing best practices for 21st century community police. And we, we're doing that consistently. Um, we're changing our leadership team. We're creating our own recommendations <laughs> within the department, um, just like the director said. We're doing a lot of self-reflecting. And, and then with the Department of Justice coming in, they're looking as well. They're looking at all our policies, all of our procedures, and they're making recommendations in regards to things that we can do better to make us more efficient. Thank you. Chief, I believe that you have um sort of a citizen advisory I council. Do. So how does that work? It works in, quite in, well. In light of all of this. <laughs> they actually, we, we meet with them on a monthly basis. Um, they are actually in the process of helping us implement or plan um, ki monthly com community ComStat meetings. So we're in the process of coming up with a way to be able to keep the those respective communities informed of things that are going on in their neighborhoods or as it relates to crime, as it relates to projects and things like that. So they are, they are really uh, working with us and we're gonna be assigning specific Chiefs Advisory Panel members to specific commanders so that they're working together. The other thing I'd like to add is it's important to recognize and we use this term constantly, almost to the point that we may not hear it anymore, but this is organic for us. So it is not static, it is not done in a vacuum, it's done in collaboration with the division, with the Department of Public Safety. And even those things that are completed, we recognize that these are recommendations now from three years ago, four years ago, and we recognize that. So that's why we're having that organic conversation. Does this still apply? Is this still applicable? Do we have the infrastructure to continue to support this recommendation? Or should we change this recommendation and do something else? That's part of the task that the chief has now with her executive staff and their executive retreat this week to assess not just these recommendations, but the functionality of the division. Does it fit where we are in 2022 moving forward? One of the things that I constantly say is that we want to build an infrastructure that we, not, that we don't grow out of, that we grow into. And I'll repeat that, that we don't grow out of, that we grow into. So that's the infrastructure and the way that we're looking at it. I think the advantage that we have, quite honestly, is that the chief and I are new. I'm, I'm just, I completed my fifth month today, actually. <laughs> so I, I think that's an advantage, really, because it gives us a fresh set of eyes, the way that we look at things, the way that we're looking at these recommendations, trying to understand the context in which these recommendations were, were made, all the things that we've been through. We certainly recognize that we've been through social unrest. We're still in a pandemic, all the impacts. <laughs> that that has, so we remain organic in these recommendations, but not just in these recommendations, but the strategies and the prioritization of public safety across the board. It's a phenomenal relationship between police and fire, which I've been told has never been that way before. Both chiefs are working together, we're doing programming together, whether it's collecting toys at Christmas time or whatever it is, we are working together. So I think by us being new and having a fresh set of eyes, not just on the recommendations, but policing reform across the board, I think gives us a tremendous advantage of bringing new ideas and bringing new things. The other thing that I would say to that is the chief and I and her executive staff, as well as my executive staff and public safety recognize that we have to be forward leaning and messaging and marketing all of this. So the public has got to see us, the community has got to see us. We've got to be involved in the commission meetings. We've got to be involved in the rec center meetings and, and being in a position to have those organic conversations so that we can solicit partnerships and help to be able to implement a lot of the things that the recommendation sets forth for us and certainly those things that the chief will develop ongoing.
Any other questions, concerns, clarifications? Would you like to see more of the dashboard? Okay. <laughs> so what I would like to show you, just so that you can see it, um, that there's a completed section um, and how we are um, designating that, the notes that are associated with that, and how we're categorizing those things that are in progress. So clearly we could talk about the completed things all day long, um, but, but Grant, if we can, let's go to something that's in progress so that we can talk about that. Because I think it's important that we walk away here this evening and understand what the definitions mean. What does in progress mean? Does it mean you're working on something, waiting on something? And in some instances, it does mean that, but we can point that out as we click on one. So an intervention specialist should attend roll call to introduce themselves, provide an overview of programs and explain scope of services. So you can see there the status notes. This recommendation will incl be included in GVI and certainly I can talk about GVI if you'd like. Plan as it moves forward throughout 2022. Once GVI is formalized, which we're in the process of doing in operation, the patrol zone commanders will be uh, delegated to tasks and create a schedule for intervention specialists to attend roll calls and throughout patrol and throughout the zones and precincts throughout the city. In other words, this is an opportunity which is led by Assistant Chief Botker to make sure that we are not only bringing policing services, but that we are also bringing intervention services as well. That we are partnering with our moral voice community, our faith-based community, and our, our services community, uh, some out of public health and some out of neighborhoods, some out of Rex and Park, so we can bring a variety of solutions to a lot of the problems that we see in our community and not just trying to arrest our way out of the problem. You've heard that said many, many times over the last decade, we're never going to arrest our way out of the problem. This model, this intervention strategy will assist us in doing that and bringing a lot of resources to a variety of problems because we recognize that a lot of the crime that happens in our community is a manifestation of many, many other social ills. And this is an opportunity for us to bring some solutions, some programming, some innovation to some of those programs and reduce the need for police to arrest people and certainly reduce the need or the, the presence of violence in our communities while we're improving the quality of life in communities as well. Chief, would you say uh, just a few words about GVI and your experience, uh, Assistant Chief Potts, as well, uh, in Detroit? Maybe just give an overview. Folks here probably are familiar with group violence intervention, but maybe just give a uh, an overview of it and a little bit about your experience with it. Absolutely. So um, in Detroit, uh, we had GVI and we had ceasefire teams. So basically, it's a collaboration between police intervention specialists, as well as other uh, agencies like FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office. And basically what you're doing is you're identifying the groups of people that are doing the most crime in your, in your neighborhood, whether it's uh, particularly violent crimes, shootings, robberies, um, associated gangs. So you give them an opportunity to correct their behavior. You give them an opportunity by providing services to help them get out, whether it's get out of a gang, relocate, get a job, get training. So that's why it's important to partner with uh, local departments and local agencies because we're gonna need them to be able to assist us with the training, with jobs, with placement, with uh, relocation. You give them that opportunity after you've identified them and you do what is called a, um, a custom notification. So you go to them and what you do is you go first and you say, I'm, I'm not here to arrest you. I'm just here because I need to give you a message. And then you bring the intervention specialist on board and they say, you say, is it okay if I bring someone up and they talk to you about it? They agree, police and intervention specialists don't work together. The police leave and the intervention specialist will talk to them and say, these are the services that we can provide. How can we help you? What can we do to assist you to be able to go on the right path. Because if you don't, if you choose not to take this, then the other route is you're going to be punished to the highest extent of the law, which is where the other side of the house comes in. Because if they choose not to take advantage of the opportunities, if they continue to go out, they continue to wreak havoc in the neighborhoods, then we're going to try to use the federal system, use whatever system we can to be able to give them the harshest punishment. But that's not what our intention is. Our intention is to help them turn their life around. Because oftentimes what you'll find is 
the reason that a lot of them are doing the things they're doing is they can't provide for their family. They can't, they, this is what they know. This is how they eat, or this is, they can't get out the game. They can't relocate. They have family that their mother is stuck in that neighborhood. So they're not gonna say anything. They're not gonna turn. They're gonna continue to do what they do because they don't want anything to happen to their family. So we try to provide as many services as we can to get them out of those situations. And that requires a collaborative effort between law enforcement, between the community, between federal agencies in order to do that. It's, it was very successful in Detroit and we were able to not only provide services and get people jobs and get them out of gangs, but we were also able to significantly reduce crime. And it's also important to understand that we recognize that we have long since come out of an era where we are going to arrest our way out of the problems that we face. Uh, we have mass incarceration in the country and we are trying to do alternative things. And you may have heard about um, our alternative policing or right response policing that's out of our call center where we have dispatchers and social workers who are working together, who are evaluating calls and calls that are appropriate for mental health workers to be dispatched to are going to those calls and providing services. And just in the beta phase that we've run that over the last several months, we've recognized the reduced calls for service, certainly no incidents of excessive force, and we've referred many individuals to services that they may not have otherwise gotten. So we know that this alternative policing or alternative response works. Statistically, we know it works. And the impact that it's having on the division of police uh, has been reduced, as well as making sure that we are reducing violence in those areas where individuals are suffering from mental health. Are there any other questions about these two categories um, that are completed and in progress? Because I want to make sure that we, we touch on one that requires further development so that you understand what further development means. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Okay, so the one that we've landed on is convert the diversity and inclusion liaison officer position into a full-time position that are housed in dedicated unit. Clearly, this is important with how we're recruiting and how we're engaging our community and certainly our communities of color. The diversity and inclusion liaison positions were filled by officers and supervisors uh, that had full-time assignment. Creating these new positions requires several steps that the chief's office is involved. As I shared with you already, the chief and her executive staff are involved in a retreat where they are re revisioning and reorganizing the division based on the retirements that are coming up, the retirements that we'll have this year, and, and the lack of personnel in a variety of areas. So this is something that's under development. It's certainly in, in conversation in the retreat. And as they come out of the retreat and, and really assess the priorities of the division, we will return to this list that requires further development and see where we are on those things. And again, place those items in a list of other priorities. First and foremost, our calls for service, making sure that we have officers who can answer the calls for service. And then everything will transcend down from that because obviously we know that patrol and responding to calls for service is the backbone of the division. So they will be revisioning that um, and restructuring what that looks like and our capacity to be able to do that given that officers are going to be leaving this year and we're in the process of hiring, but they still have to go to the academy for seven months. But we're gonna to continue to press on this and make sure that we can implement this when we have the resources and personnel to do it. So Chief, what would a, what would a timeline look like on this? Uh, well, is this something 12 to 24 months? What does, do you have a sense of how long this will take? I will know, we will know better once we finish this uh, retreat that we're okay. in the process of doing, because then we, we know that um, we have to make sure, like the director said, that we're able to uh, meet the requirements and the needs of the, the, the residents of Columbus. So we want to make sure that we fill those positions first. But hopefully our goal is to have someone in place before the end of the year, if possible. Um, that's, that's our plan. I know this was one of the questions, um, Commissioner Sean, blanking on Sean's last name, uh, Children's Carter. Service. Carter. Carter. This was one of the 
issues uh, that Commissioner Carter raised, and I think other commissioners did uh, at one of our last briefings. So I wanted to make sure we, we touched on that and gave right. an update and timeline to it. And so we know that the goal is to have someone that doesn't have another job, doesn't have another position. We want a dedicated full-time person. So while we're, we still have people that are doing the function, we want to make sure that we're dedicating specific personnel to that. And that's going to just be uh, a situation where we have to see where our personnel is going to be toward the end of uh, this retreat and as we lose the officers to buyouts. This leads me to a question, and it's about the buyouts. So I know that the t time period ended for people, I guess, to apply. I think I heard that there were over 200 individuals who expressed an interest. And I think I also recall that in terms of implementing this, not all 100 would leave right away. There'd be sort of a rolling time period. But I would ask, how long will it take for that to be fully completed in terms of those 100 individuals who will be selected? So once the list has been finalized, it's like a 90-day implementation. So probably, if I had to guess, by the beginning of June, that should probably all be done. And that's just, just my guesstimation. It all depends on when the list comes out and we're able to actually start implementing. And because we recognize that, Chair Jackson, the division and the chief, myself, uh, deputy directors and public safety are working with the chief to visualize what that's going to look like. Uh, the things that we may have to do less of and certainly shifting personnel to be able to do more things. Uh, because we will lose a substantial number of ranking officers and we recognize that. So we're in the process of planning for that. As a matter of fact, we've been in that process for quite some time trying to vision what that will look like. So while we certainly understand the number will be 100, it's not a surprise to us. Um, I've had many conversations with Assistant Chief and the Chief on what that will look like and what our process will be. And we've certainly offered all the support that we can out of public safety to the division to make sure that we can get that done. And one of the things that we are visioning is a, a, a lateral transfer program for police officers who are certified in the state of Ohio. And we're in the process of building that out as well because we understand that that will help us to compensate for some of the officers that we lose. Are there any other questions? Then uh, I would, was there one? Okay. I appreciate the lateral transfer process. What type of vetting are you doing? Because we want to be as conscious of biases coming in from other sure. communities into Columbus. Um, well, that's absolutely one of the things that myself, the chief, the assistant chief Potts, um, executive staff and public safety, civil service, uh, HR, we've had that conversation they will follow the very stringent process that we have in place now for officers. The only thing that they will not have to do is take the test because they're already certified in the state of Ohio. They're OPATA certified and we will vet them like we do everyone else to include work record history and references and all of the other things to make sure that we are not bringing in another department's problem. So I appreciate that perspective. It is something that we've talked about. So it will be a very rigorous process uh, for them to come. But I'll be honest with you, we have a lot of pride in the Columbus Division of Police, and we think that there's going to be a lot of uh, women and men across the state of Ohio who are going to see the change that is, is afoot right now in Columbus and want to be a part of that because it, we recognize it's not just always about the money. It's about the opportunity to be a part of something that is historic. And that's the way I consider this movement in Columbus right now in public safety, that it's historic. And there will be women and men who just want to be a part of that. And, and we're excited for that process to begin. And that's going to be a much shorter academy time for them. I don't know what the final number will be, but it certainly won't be the seven months that our new recruits go through now. So we'll be able to process those officers, vet those officers, and get them trained and get them deployed to the streets of Columbus. Would they be on the one-year probation after whatever training they take in the academy, or are they automatic? Well, they will start at um, the bottom of the seniority list, and, and I believe there is a probation piece. They will have, a, probation. They will have, the they will have a probationary period, but um, understand that they're coming from agencies where they may have done five plus years, so their probationary period may not necessarily look like 
um, a, new a, new, a newer officer, but there will be a probationary period. Yep. Okay. And then you said something about coming out into the community with being as transparent as possible, all the processes or the ones that impact the community trust uh, specifically. And the 200 officers that are leaving, quite a few of them are community liaison officers. What is your plan um, if you lose a good number of them, or are you going to try to figure out what's a good number to lose? So actually, they're, they're not community liaison officers. The majority of the officers that will be leaving, um, especially based off the buyout, are um, officers that actually work in bureaus. Okay. Um, because our uh, department is seniority based. So the majority of the officers that have the seniority and the time to leave are actually already uh, in places like investigations and traffic bureau and uh, places like that. So they're not, uh, the majority of them are not CLOs. Okay. The other thing I will share with you as we conclude, and I shared, I've been here five months. The chief has been here eight months with Assistant Chief Potts. One of the things I think we consistently hear and everywhere that we go, the meetings, when we receive feedback, because we're always interested in the feedback, if they a renewed hope because Chief Brian, Assistant Chief Potts and myself are here, but not just because of that, but because of the officers, the command staff officers that we've recently promoted, that they have a renewed hope and they're excited for the change. They're, re they're excited for the reform. And that actually uh, motivates us to, to do more, to be in more places, to have more conversation, because we recognize that the officers, the women and men who do the work every day, the very hard work that we ask them to do are excited, they're motivated, and they have hope. And when we can bring hope back to our streets, that becomes contagious to our residents. And we recognize that that'll be an opportunity for us to do something, as I've already said, very historic here in the city of Columbus. So I'm very excited about the months ahead for all of us um, here in Columbus. I'd just like to make, uh, you know, so one comment, and I know it has to be a balancing act. We certainly will need to bring other officers in. So this is about the lateral piece. I'm sure we'll need to do that to keep our numbers up, but I am much more excited about the possibility that we move forward, that we will, and maybe it's the cadet program that you talked about, that we will actually in the future have officers from the city of Columbus. I believe that I read that in the last graduating class, we had our first Somali officer. That's correct. As diverse as this city is, and, and for me, it's always beyond black and white. I mean, we have so many different ethnic uh, you know, backgrounds that I hope we will see much more of that. And again, people from the city of Columbus, I mean, not, not all, but certainly more from the city working in the neighborhoods where they, they grow, grew up. So to me, it's a balance, but I, would just, I felt the need to say that. Sure. Understand the lateral. But still, I am much more interested in looking at the future as we look at diversifying the department. That is our goal, that is our hope, and that is our plan as we recruit. And we recognize, Chair Jackson, that when that Somalian officer returns to his community and says that he is a police officer for the Division of Police in the city of Columbus, he brings with him the hope of a neighborhood, the hope of a family, that they can also someday do that too. And that's why I mentioned that hope piece, because hope is being restored in our city, not just in the Somalian community, but the Nepali community. We have a Nepali officer that's in the academy as well. So we recognize that this is a very historic moment, and I'm excited to see the things that will unfold in the months to come. Well, I would say on behalf of uh, these folks, uh, the Safety Advisory Commission, uh, and they worked hard. I mean, we were together from, I believe, April of 2018, our last working meeting, which was a marathon, when we actually decided on the 80 recommendations, was December of 2019. And then the recommendations were actually take, uh, conveyed to the mayor in January of 2020. I believe a total of 22 meetings, and those were just the com commission meetings, not all of the um, committee meetings that we had. And I don't know if I've had a chance to say thank you to each of you. We greeted each other tonight as if it was a family reunion. Mm -hmm. 
um, because we've been together. And so, and since I've transitioned, of course, being chair of the Safety Advisory Commission to chair of the Civilian Police Review Board, I think of you uh, on many a day. But again, I want to thank you on behalf of the city of Columbus and the citizens of Columbus for the hard work. Truly, you did the foundational work for what we're talking about today. And then I want to thank the director and the chief for briefing us today. I look forward to being able to link to this where I can actually uh, read it. I'm quite interested in it. But thank you. For You're very this. welcome. Okay? Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all of your work. Be safe with the weather coming in, everyone.